Okay, so welcome back. So we are just about to discuss heterotrimeric G proteins and of all these classes of metabotropic glutamate receptors, we'd like to know, you know, which ones are coupled to which G pro heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so heterotrimeric G proteins basically consist of three subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. And basically there are 16 genes coding for the alpha subunits. So there are 16 possible uh, alpha subunits that you can make your heterotrimeric G protein out of. There are five different beta subunits, and there are 12 different gamma subunits. So there is quite a lot of heterotrimeric G proteins that you in principle could make. Now, the entire um, combination of the three subunits, this entire thing here, is what is known as the G protein, the heterotrimeric G protein. So this is the heterotrimeric G protein. Now, um, often people will write, uh, so let me just write this, heterotrimeric G protein. So often people write, um, uh, when they write G proteins, they write things like GQ, or GI, or G11, or GO, you'll see them write that. Now, what does that mean? Well, basically, the name of the heterotrimeric G protein is completely and utterly determined by what alpha subunit you make it out of. We don't care, really, what beta and gamma subunits you use. The main uh, results of the G protein, um, and I hate to say this because, you know, people who re spend their lives researching the poor beta and gamma subunits will hate me, but the main results of the G protein is, it's probably fair to say, come from, they come from the alpha subunit rather than the beta and the gamma subunit. The beta and the gamma subunit do do a lot, but the alpha subunit probably is more important. Okay, so the name of the G protein, basically it's named after the, its alpha subunit. We don't care which of these beta subunits you pick, and we don't care which of the gamma subunits pick, we pick, you pick. What we care about is which alpha subunit you have. So basically there are 16 different types of which some of the examples are alpha S, is an alpha subunit, alpha Q is a different alpha subunit, alpha 11 is a different alpha subunit, alpha I is a different alpha subunit, and alpha O is a different subunit. So basically when people name their G proteins, uh, they name it after the alpha subunit. So GQ is the G protein, is any G protein that has uh, its alpha subunit is alpha Q, a GI is one where the alpha subunit is alpha I, and etc. for 11 and O. And of course, S, the GSG protein, is um, any G protein with the alpha subunit being alpha S. Okay, right. Uh, so, basically, firstly, let's discuss mGluR1 and mGluR5, these class 1 G pro uh, class 1 metabotropic glutamate receptors. So, basically, class 1 metabotropic glutamate receptors are coupled to either GQ, G proteins, or they are coupled to G11 G proteins, which means that this alpha subunit is either alpha Q or it's alpha 11, and we don't care what beta and gamma subunit you've got. Basically, it's the, the alpha subunit is alpha Q or alpha 11. Now, alpha Q and alpha 11 actually do pretty much the exact same thing. Alpha Q is more famous than alpha 11 because it's probably more common in the body, but it, alpha Q and alpha 11 do exactly the same thing in essence. So, let's go over what happens to these class 1 uh, receptors which have alpha Q and alpha or alpha 11. Uh, so, initially what happens is that the alpha subunit has GDP bonded to it. So here is a GDP molecule bonded to it. However, when glutamate binds to the glutamate binding domain, and that, that causes a conformational change, the cysteine-rich domain here transfers that conformational domain down to this catalytic portion down here, which then chops off the GDP from the alpha subunit, and instead uh, binds on the GTP. So you now have the alpha subunit bonded to GTP rather than GDP. So here's GTP bonded to the alpha subunit. Okay, right, so you now have alpha bonded to GTP. And basically, um, this is either, we, we know it's either alpha Q or alpha 11. And basically, alpha Q 
uh, GTP or alpha 11 GTP. So I might write, often people do write alpha Q slash 11 to denote that it's either Q or it's 11. So if you've ever seen that, that's what that means. It doesn't mean alpha 11 is another name for alpha Q. It means it's either an alpha Q or it's an alpha 11. But they do effectively the same thing. This then goes off and activates an enzyme which is in the membrane of cells, uh, known as phospholipase C beta 2. Oh, sorry, not beta, uh, just phospholipase C beta, rather, sorry. Phospholipase C beta. So this alpha Q slash 11, with this GTP bound to it, goes off and activates phospholipase C beta. And phospholipase C beta then takes a, mem a component of the cell membrane, known as PIP2, which stands for phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Um, uh, and it takes this from the membrane, basically, and it converts it into um, diacylglyceride, which I'll draw here, DAG, and IP3, or inositol 1,4,5-bisphosphate. So it breaks it down, basically, into IP3, and DAG. Okay, right, so let me just write their full names out. So PIP2's full name is phosphatidyl inositol. So let me just write this down. So phosphatidyl, what phosphatidyl means is basically it's the nay, it's the prefix that you use when you have a phospholipid attached to something. So remember, cell membranes are made out of phospholipids. So PIP2 is basically just a phospholipid with something else stuck on the end. So it's like that sort of thing. It's a phospholipid with something stuck, an extra group stuck onto its head. So phosphatidyl um, inositol, and this thing that you've stuck onto its head is inositol, basically. Uh, 4,5-bisphosphate. So you've stuck on an inositol group, which is um, uh, just basically a six-carbon molecule uh, with hydroxyl groups of every single one of those carbons. And then on the fourth and the fifth carbon, you've stuck phosphate groups onto the hydroxyl groups. Okay, so that's PIP2. DIG stands for diacylglyceride. And basically, that is what you get from a phospholipid if you cut off the phosphate group. So diacylglyceride. Okay, so that's just glycerol bonded to two free fatty acids. And finally, IP3 is inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. So you've broken down PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. You've made diacylglyceride, so that means you must have chucked off this inositol 4,5-bisphosphate bit. But you've also cut off the original phosphate group of the uh, phospholipid, phospholipid component of PIP2. So that phosphate group goes off with the inositol, so you end up with inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. So this is inositol, inositol uh, 1,4,5-trisphosphate. Okay, right. And basically, uh, these two molecules have, a num have downstream signaling properties. So, di diacylglyceride activates protein kinase C, so an important enzyme which phosphorylates uh, phosphorylation sites. So, it activates protein kinase C. IP3, meanwhile, goes to the endoplasmic reticulum. So, I'll draw this blob to represent the endoplasmic reticulum. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, there is, a, um, there is a calcium channel, basically, which is an IP3 receptor. So this is an IP3 receptor. And basically, IP3 binds to this IP3 receptor. And when it does, that causes the IP3 receptor to adopt an open conformation. And all the calcium, well, calcium that's stored in the endoplasmic reticulum can then leave the endoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm. Calcium has a number of signaling properties in the cytoplasm, one of which is to activate protein kinase C even more. So that also leads to the activation of protein kinase C. Okay, so these then are your two downstream signaling molecules. Calcium has gone up in the cytoplasm, and protein kinase C activity has gone up in the uh, cytoplasm. Okay, so that's how uh, the class 1 glutamate, um, metabotropic glutamate receptors achieve their downstream effect.
So uh, just to um, say again, they are agonized they are the, by this molecule quisqualate or quisqualic acid, which binds to them in the same place as glutamate and activates them just like glutamate. Okay, so in the next video, we'll discuss class 2 and class 3 metabotropic glutamate receptors.